Good afternoon, everybody. On behalf of the U.S. Embassies, Embassy and Consulates in Brazil, we want to welcome you to our third panel discussion in our Mentor Talks Brazil series. And my name is Julie McKay, and I'm the Deputy Cultural Affairs Officer here at the U.S. Embassy in Brasilia. Of course, I'm not at the embassy now. I'm at my house, as I think probably all of you are. Uh, and we realize it's a tough time for everybody. And one way we wanted to support our large community of U.S. exchange alumni, here in Brazil, we have more than 20,000 alumni. And one of the ways we wanted to help support you guys is to share advice and mentorship in key areas. And we've already uh, started this panel discussion, this series every Wednesday in April. And we've covered leadership in a crisis, and creating opportunities in tough times. Today's topic will be resilience in a crisis, and it's gonna focus on practical ways that you can build resilience, both for yourself uh, and or for your business or organization during the COVID-19 pandemic or during any challenging time. Um, at the end of the discussion, as I mentioned, we really want you to leave with at least three practical things that you can do to help yourself, your business or organization to build resilience. Um, we also mentioned we want it to be a discussion. So please put any questions that you have for the panelists in the chat space and we'll make sure that they get answered either during the discussion or in the chat space. Um, before we get started, let me give a big, big, big thank you to our partners in this project the talented and inspiring MG100 Fellows, and they're the ones serving as the moderator and the panelists. We really appreciate the time that you've donated and for sharing your thoughts and expertise with our alumni. Um, so thank you guys for tuning in today, and I hope you will find it helpful, and I hope that we'll all have a few extra tools to be more resilient at the end of this discussion. So now I want to turn it over to our moderator, uh, Rhett Powell. Over to you, Rhett. Thank you, Julie. Uh, and again, thank you for the opportunity to, to be with all of you today. Uh, and thank you to the Embassy Brazil for the opportunity as well. <clears throat> and it's, it's exciting to be here because this is, uh, to me, this is, these are very interesting times. And they're interesting times uh, in, in many, many ways. And, and so today's topic, resilience, I think is a, a very important one for us as uh, leaders. Uh, uh, you know, the coronavirus is having an impact on all of us. It's uh, every business, every family is feeling the effect of this pandemic. And, and it's important as leaders, I think, that we respond. Uh, and it's important that we take care of our families, ourselves, uh, our teams and our people and our customers. And so we have to be at our best in order to do that. Uh, so today we're going to explore how we can do that better. Uh, how we're going to, like, as Julie said, we're going to leave you with some tools, I think, uh, that help you do that. Um, now I'm going to introduce the panel in just a minute, uh, but let me tell you a little bit about myself first. Uh, I'm an executive advisor, speaker, and author. Uh, in 2018, I was named the best small business coach in the United States the number one thought leader on entrepreneurship by Thinkers360. Uh, I write uh, a column for Forbes magazine, I write for Inc. magazine, and I write for Thrive Global. And I host a daily LinkedIn live show where I interview today's top business leaders like we have on, on the panel today. Now, uh, I've got some, some great people on the program today. Uh, one of them is, I know, going to join us late, uh, and one of them is trying to get on. And so, uh, but I've got Sharon... We'll start with Sharon Melnick, Dr. Sharon Melnick. She's a leading authority on stress and resilience in women's leadership, uh, informed by 10 years of psychology research at Harvard Medical School. Her methods have transformed professionals at over 40 Fortune 500 companies. She's a business psychologist, and she is known for going beyond theory and platitudes to provide practical tools that work in the heat of the moment. Her first book, Success Under Stress, Powerful Tools to Stay Calm, Confident, and Productive, is considered a Bible among uh, teams who want to be resilient and highly productive. Her second book, Confidence When It Counts, has helped countless women communicate boldly and increase their opportunities. Uh, we're going to have Dr. Edie Greenblatt on here in a few minutes. 
Uh, she earned her PhD in the Joint Program in Organizational Behavior at Harvard University and Harvard Business School. She's a transformational coach and educator, resilience pioneer, uh, integration visionary. She's the founder and president of Executive Care Coaching and Consulting. She creates radically innovative uh, interdisciplinary uh, programs to help leaders, teams, and organizations grow, laugh, and energize while they uh, rise to meet demanding performance goals. Her book, her book, Restore Yourself, was a winner of the 2009 Indie Book Award for Best Career uh, Books and declared a top 10 business and health uh, and wellness book of the year. Uh, Lewis Carter is CEO and founder of the Best Practice Institute, a benchmark research consortium, association, and management consulting firm specializing in helping organizations and C-suite senior executives achieve their market strategy through talent management, executive coaching, leadership development, organizational culture, and change management. He's the author of nearly a dozen books on best practices in organizational leadership. His latest book, In Great Company, How to uh, Spark Peak Performance by Creating an Emotionally Connected Workplace. I wanna thank uh, those, those uh, panelists for being with me today and joining us. Uh, and I wanted to start out uh, by asking Sharon, I think, I, don't, I haven't seen Edie join yet. So I wanted to ask you to sort of define resilience and what does it mean? And has that changed in the last month <laughs> as this crisis has hit? Uh, in your, and, and what are you learning about, what have you learned in the last couple of weeks about being resilient? Yeah, those are really good questions. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Rhett, for your service and for being someone who just, you know, uplifts uh, so many people everywhere you go. So it's, it's an honor to be here with you. And thanks to all of you who um, are really, you know, trying to make your dent in the world uh, here. Really glad to be on the line in uh, any way that I could be helpful. So, um, you know, in terms of how, uh, I, I think um, that we all have our own definition of what resilience looks like for us, right? And um, I actually would encourage all of us to have our own definition. And if anybody wants to kind of write into the chat about like, what does resilience really look like for you? I mean, I can tell you what some of the common elements are of it, um, but uh, I think everyone, um, you, it, it's helpful to you actually to have some idea of uh, kind of how you want to show up as, because then it gives you some um, aspiration, it gives you a focal point, um, it gives you an anchor that you can try to be intentional in the service of, like you could try to show up as that person or you could try to create those conditions. So, uh, but I, I think that there's uh, some common elements here that are, uh, you know, people wanna um, be able to have a feeling of calm in their own mind, right? And in their own body. Um, right. Because uh, under stress, you know, we can get hijacked and uh, our adrenaline is, you know, kind of flowing and it can make us have that kind of jacked up uh, feeling, um, that feeling where you can't turn your head off, that feeling where you can't sleep well uh, through the night, um, that feeling that you just, um, you know, you just uh, can't kind of concentrate, um, you know, Signs of stress uh, people are seeing these days um, in your brain, in your body, or in your behavior. So in your brain, your um, you know, difficulty uh, kind of concentrating or making uh, decisions in your body, um, muscle tension, difficulty sleeping, maybe having your immune system, which is worn down, digestive issues, muscle tension. Um, and in your behavior, you know, maybe you're snapping at people or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe you're isolating from people and you just are overwhelmed and you can't deal with people you feel like you need to um, get away. So these are signs of stress to be uh, kind of looking for. And I think the idea of resilience is to be able to feel um, like you have more control over how you are feeling kind of, you know, in your mind, in your body, um, and in your behavior so that you can, um, uh, feel and make decisions and take actions, uh, that are constructive and productive to help you have kind of the outcome that you want. So I think it's both 
how you are feeling now, how you are going through it, uh, as well as kind of creating the outcome or, or going through it having adaptation or success that you want on the other side. And um, for most of you, that's not only for yourself, but for the people who you are sheltering in place with, um, the farmers that you're trying to influence, uh, the students, the community members, because um, uh, I, I know that that's what all of you stand for. So I think just as a kind of, just to start with the basics, uh, I think that we're looking at um, a kind of having more control uh, over yourself, over your current state, over the outcome that you want. And, uh, and I would say the final element um, that we all want to strive for is even coming through this in a way where you feel like you were even better than when you started in, on, in some way, right? So that you grew um, in your leadership, you grew in your innovative um, capacity, you grew in your connections, you, you had ideas that were helpful. And uh, so if I could start off with that um, as a, a kind of a, a focal point, then um, you know, today we can discuss, well, how can we get there? Hi, Edie. Hey, Edie, how are you? Thank you for being here. Hey, so Edie. Uh, oh, just for being, for my delay. No worries, no worries. Uh, so the, I, I'd ask Sharon to sort of define resilience and, and what her thoughts on, on what, what that means, because we hear the term a lot being thrown around, particularly in the media. And I'm not sure I really truly understood it until I talked to the both of you a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> and so I wanted, I wanted you guys, to, you to share your thought on resilience and, 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 and really in terms of what it means overall, but what, what it, how has that changed in your, in your opinion in the last few weeks? Or is there anything, any other new thoughts that you have about resilience? Well, thank you. I apologize. I'm late. I was delayed at the vet. My puppy will be fine, but it's a little slower to move things and I, and I'm not home. So, um, Thank you for having me. Um, I caught the end of, uh, of uh, what Sharon was talking about and everything I heard I agree with. Um, so there were a couple of questions. I'm going to try to get at all of them. The first one, um, I'm going to go in reverse order. I started doing research on resilience in 1995 when nobody knew what, it was, what I was talking about. I didn't know what I was talking about either. I didn't use the word resilience in my research or my book. Uh, we talked about work-life balance. We talked about energy, health, wellness, neurotransmitters, physical things, psychological. So, um, so in terms of new definitions, I don't have a new definition of resilience. I spent five years creating one and then the last 15 years revising it. So um, basically, uh, the, so I'm going to skip to the discussion of um, confusion about what resilience is. The confusion about resilience is, first of all, um, there isn't one definition. So resilience is used, the term is used, there's a definition used in physics, there's definitions used in psychology, there's definitions used in social work, there's definitions used in different fields. So if you come from psychology, resilience is a very particular thing. It's about the capacity to return from trauma. Okay, if you, if you work in metallurgy, resilience has to do with the nature of things, right, to sort of regain their shape. So, so if you have multiple beliefs about resilience, it's almost like talking about stress, right? We don't have one definition of stress. That's why we have to get permission to, to do medical things for stress because we don't have a, you know, whose who's stress are we talking about? So for me, when I'm talking about resilience, I'm, I'm talking about having the skills and the capacity, both the skills and the capacity to return yourself to the energy level and the productivity level and the wellness level that you need to get to. So most people are talking, so I, mine's a broader definition. I talk about personal resources. Those are the energies and the capacities that you own and control. So you can break these down into four, five, six, or seven categories. To make it easy, I broke it into four, but there's no perfection here. Physical energy, the physical capacity to do what you need to do, right? Being well-rested enough, having the physical energy to drag your, your, your 
your carry on through an airport to stay the ability to stay awake the ability to lift something the ability to 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 or a physical capacity that includes your capacity to fight disease so it's physical wellness macro and 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 micro that's physical resources you also need cognitive resources right you need mental capacity you need the ability to solve problems you need the ability to make decisions and boy we could talk about that in terms of what i've learned lately <laughs> okay so you need cognitive re resilience you need the ability to Recover from being distracted. A distraction can pull you, if you're in flow, right, if you're in a, this optimal state, one distraction can reduce your capacity to focus for 15 minutes. So if you don't have cognitive resilience and skills and tools, we'll talk about those, it means, and, 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 and most of our energies are compromised now. So if you could finish a sentence while the dog was barking last week, you may not be able to finish a sentence while the dog is barking now because your cognitive resilience, your cognitive resources are reduced. So it's physical and cognitive. Let's talk about um, social and spiritual. Again, you can split them, but what is your capacity to get energy and to have energy associated with connections to people and deities and things bigger than you? Okay, so what do you have the capacity to, to ask for help? Do you have the ability to feel the support of other people when they're there? Do you have the ability to feel connected to a deity or to, a, right, to, to some social entity or spiritual entity? I'm sorry, I had to close, um, I had to close a, 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 a window. Do you have the capacity to connect to people and things and feel what's there and have the energy to do that, right? Do you have the energy to believe, right? To believe as an act of faith toward a larger entity that takes fuel, right? When someone says, well, just believe if you're religious, believe, right? God will help you. It I'm sorry, you either have a huge load of faith, right? Which is also affected by resilience right? Or it takes energy to focus for that moment to pray. It takes energy to believe. Okay, this isn't just, well, if you were good enough, it would all be easy. It's not. You need social and spiritual resources to hold you up. And if those have dropped, and I can guarantee that they've dropped, right? That's finding that is going to be more difficult. The fourth domain, again, you can split it into one or two or three things. The fourth domain is psychological and emotional, psycho-emotional. And I, I blend them because when we try to parse them out, it gets, we get into a whole discussion of cog cognitive neuropsych and then we mix cognition in it. So let's just talk about how you feel, <laughs> okay? Emotions, psychological and emotional, okay? How much patience do you have, right? How optimistic are you able to be? How easy for is it for you to feel despair, right? Your emotional states, your emotional fuel, your ability to regulate it, okay? It's not just, oh yeah, I'm happy. Our capacity to get ourselves happy in the normal ways and to maintain it is compromised, right? We're gonna talk about behaviors and conditions. So those are the four big buckets, physical, cognitive, social, spiritual, emotional, psychological. If you have the ability to move those up and recover when they drop below where you want them to be or where your normal is, that to me is resilience. So it's the ability to move it mm -hmm. and then the capacity, the capacity, and then we can talk about how to do that. Yeah, we're gonna, that we are gonna talk about that. Yeah. I wanna see, I want people to raise their hands. How many people have been sort of at home and not in an office or in a, in a workplace for the last few weeks. Is that most everybody? Okay. So I, that, that's, that's interesting. Okay. That, that, uh, uh, the reason I wanted to ask that is, do you guys think that, um, uh, and I'll start with Sharon, uh, are there ways that people can manage 
this new environment uh, and try to get some sort of sense of norm, norm, normalcy, I guess. Uh, I know in my household, we've got two kids doing school. Uh, Julie is working uh, from home. I'm working from home now. Uh, there is a certain amount of trying to figure out how that is supposed to work. Um, and, and so are there some tools or things that you, you've been talking about with others and, 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 and sharing with others that might be able to help us sort of put together something that works for us, a system that works for us that would help sort of bring the stress levels down because it's stressful when, when something new like this, when you're doing something new like this, it's stressful. And so are there some tools that you can sort of employ to help manage that? Sure. Um, so the first thing uh, that I would do in order to approach this is um, I would encourage you and uh, all of you on the line to ask yourself, what is stressful about this? Right? So to try to isolate the aspects of the situation that are stressful for you, right? Because um, otherwise it's kind of too big and vague and it's overwhelming and then you don't even know what to address. Because each aspect of it, so um, there's, uh, you know, that, that there's, um, that you have to homeschool while you're working. Okay, well then we can like try to think of solutions, you know, for that. Or there's um, kind of, the newness of it, okay, so then let's talk about like what's the implication of the newness for you, right? Or there is the, um, you know, for some of you, like I was looking at some of your um, uh, chat scroll that, um, you know, it's that the people around you are freaking out and you are trying to keep your emotional uh, kind of, you know, center and, and keep them optimistic. Okay, then we could talk about that or um and or it's not that these are or i mean these could be layered right you could have all of these uh you know at once and for some of you it was the revenue issue that your business or businesses you're consulting um don't have business right now so you're really trying to make good decisions about how to pivot so what I, the very first thing that i would do is i would try to break uh this uh kind of vague amorphous sense of like i just you know feel at e you know not at ease into what are the component parts of it and then let me try to take on each of them systematically and you may want to begin um, as Edie was referring to by maybe getting yourself into a state a mental and emotional state uh, where you can think clearly because um, we all, uh, I'm assuming we all, only because I've experienced it, so I'm assuming you've experienced it, right? Have had, you know, those moments of panic, right? And, um, uh, and you know, where we're uncertain uh, about the future and what if uh, this happens or doesn't uh, happen. And then we get kind of locked in and we get into a crunch. And then uh, what happens is that our decision making is all filtered through the emotional centers of our brain, the fear centers of our brain, uh, which uh, have evolved because of our survival mode, right? And there's certain qualities uh, of decision making. Uh, the very first quality is that everything gets put through a filter of, and what does this mean about me? Right, so it's very self-focused, it's very kind of um, myopic uh, in that way. You're not really able to see, you know, kind of the full universe of possibilities. You're not able to think of all the people who you could connect to or all of the ideas. You literally can only reference the past in order to know how to solve problems. You cannot have new ideas for the future. So I would say the first thing for us to do is to sort of get into a calm mental state. And then the second thing, um, would be uh, for you to then kind of break down, you know, what are all the things. And uh, so if you're saying that, okay, it's like an issue of a lot of people being in the home, then uh, I would be having a family meeting or regular family meetings, you know, right? And having a discussion about like, okay, what would an ideal day look like for us, 
right? What does each person need, <laughs> right? And then like, how can we work out a schedule of who needs to be in what area of the shelter, you know what I mean, in order to, because we have calls. Um, or, you know, who needs certain levels of quiet at certain times of the day, or who's on lunch duty, or who's on cleanup duty, or who's on wipe down the handles duty, or who's on, you know, whatever, or, you know, and then um, let's put some big rocks into our day, like having dinner together, or, you know, doing a family walk, or exercise time, or, you know, things like that, and then let's organize our day uh, around that, what do the kids um, need in order to be, you know, learning or kind of taken care of? You know, there's an amazing site that I came across. It's called like Lockdown Tips and Ideas or something like that. It has a few million. It's a Facebook site. It has a few million people on there, and it is just a constant stream of like super constructive, like things to do with kids, things to do with, you know, like groups, virtual groups for kids, virtual learning, whatever. So it's just, um, I'm just trying to show you is like approach it systematically. And I, it sounded like Edie wanted to say a lot more about decision making, which would be helpful. No, so I mean, to me, it sounds like getting in a routine is, is really key to sort of maintaining that sanity, isn't it? Yeah, it's one of the things. And, and I, a routine for sure, but also one that is intentional, one that sort of helps people get their needs met. Like I, you know, I've been talking to people who are like, you know, I have to do my afternoon walk. Like if I don't do that, I'm just, you know, I'm just not sane. And so I just need to educate everyone around me. Like I need that time, you know, um, or, you know, you, you see all these signs of like, you know, parents who are like, you know, for the next half an hour, you know, I'm on a call. And if you, um, and unless it's urgent and you know what I mean or whatever. And if it's like, if it's about this, see this person, if it's about this, do this. And, you know, it's like, you know, it's like whatever you need to do. Yeah, I was talking to a CEO yesterday and, and the conversation was, was really interesting. They said, you know, we've, we've asked our people for a schedule and, and, and most people came back with schedules, you know, nine to 11 is work, 11 to one is kids and lunch and, and school stuff. One to four is again, work. And then, and then, you know, you, you, then it's family time. And then, from eight to 10 or eight to nine, finishing up work, you know, so it's, it's taking into account all the life that's happening, but it, it's sort of set boundaries for everybody that they know that these, in these times they're working and these times they're dealing with family stuff, health stuff, whatever it is. And so they've been very, it's been very helpful in terms of keeping people sort of uh, um, in this sort of uh, structure. Uh, yeah, right. Structure. Edie, what do you, what do you, what, your, what are your thoughts? So Sharon and I have been on calls together before. I love what she says. So yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so a couple of things. So what, what you're talking about broadly is boundary management. We have to manage our personal boundaries and everything that we have to do during uh, this time is what best practice has always been. So we are suddenly thrust into being brand new beginners, right? We're all the brand new beginners at this in many cases. And both we feel compelled to already be expert at it. And there are pressures to get good quickly, okay? So personal boundary management. Um, so scheduling is a form of personal boundary management. When I set a schedule for myself, I'm creating personal boundaries between myself and others, but I'm also creating boundaries, intrapersonal boundaries. I'm also creating boundaries between the two competing narratives in my head, right? Because I'm at home looking at the pile of dirty laundry, which is screaming that I need to wash it, right? Because not all of us have the luxury of our own home office with a door that's soundproof and life proof, okay? So, a schedule helps you with your, in, not just your external boundaries, with your family, with your work, but it helps you with your own boundaries. The reason that helps is because every time part of you decides you sh is competing to decide, should I be working or should I be taking care of something else? Because there are triggers all around us, right? Our, our houses have all these triggers. This is, this is the picture of the person who is more productive than I am. And this is the chipped paint that I've been meaning to fix for years. So we have triggers all around us that are competing for our attention when we're home. So if you set a schedule, you are making a contract between you and yourself 
that this time is intentionally allocated for this. And when the little I have to clean the house narrative comes up, right, that voice that Sharon was talking about, the what does this mean about me that it's dirty in my house? You can say, listen, I'm working. We've made an agreement. Me and myself and all of the stakeholders in my head who are all challenging me. We've made an agreement that this two hours is for work. And in order to shut that person up, right, we make an agreement that on Tuesday from four to five, we're going to clean the house. Okay, so you are managing internal stakeholders as well by creating a structure. So, so the, the, the CEO work that you talked about, Red, is exactly what is, is best practice all the time. Right. Tell people, these are the hours that I am available to do these things. And these are the days of the week. And these are the months. And you know, you, know, you, you guys know about Restoration Vacation. I have a, a business that's an extension of the resilience work that I do, where we help people create those boundaries so that they can also manage to go on vacation. Because you're never gonna get to go on vacation and you're never gonna restore yourself personally or professionally if you don't get really good at man you know, creating and creating external structures to help you. So that's, so structure, yes, absolutely a thousand percent. And those boundaries need to be explained and, and, and discussed and aligned on with everybody. And like the two of you were saying, with family members, with, right? Yeah. In your calendar, and I would put up my calendar, um, but I, I don't wanna take the time. If you have not, if your calendar doesn't have at least six categories of activities in it, you're lying to yourself. So if you have a calendar and it just has work and home, who are you kidding? If it doesn't get on your calendar, it's not going to happen. Okay. And if, um, and at the, if at the end at 11 o'clock at 1101, someone wants me to pop one of my calendars up, I will. I have, I have colors for restoration. I have oranges for res hey, what restores. Edie, go ahead and do it. Edie, go ahead and do it. Okay. Pop it up. Okay. So, um, you guys talk about something interesting while I do this. Um, so I, what we'll do is I want to, I want to get to questions. I had one more question for you guys and then I wanted to get to the questions that everybody's asking. Um, uh, Sharon, you, you have some techniques to sort of, as she's pulling up her calendar, you have some techniques about how to maintain calm when you sort of get that overwhelming feeling. And some of the things you were showing us a couple of weeks ago, I thought were really fascinating and the, the breathing and all that. Can you share some of those techniques? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, what's in, important to, to, to know just conceptually it's, um, is that it's our nervous system that we have to bring to bear uh, uh, to deal with all demands of our day. And our nervous system has two parts to it. We have kind of like an on system, your sympathetic nervous system, which gives you focus and energy to solve problems. And um, you have an off system, your parasympathetic nervous system, which gives you access to calm and rejuvenation and all the ways that um, Edie was talking about. And what happens um, is that when we're in stressful circumstances is that we tend to only use the on button. Now we were already only using the on button even before and now we're really in a heightened state of alert. Um, and uh, so we're overactive in our on button. And, um, but it's the off button that gives us access to that calm, that rejuvenation, that ability to take a step back, to see the bigger picture, to have new thoughts. Uh, Etc. So what people are asking for when they're saying, how can I have more of that calm is they're saying, how can I have more activation of my off system, my parasympathetic nervous system. So there's many, many things that you could do. But one thing um, that you could do is your mind follows your breath. So the quickest way to change your mental state is to change your breathing. And when we're under stress, we tend to not even be aware at all of our breath. We're just breathing rapid and shallow. And so um, like literally, if you just slow down your breath, <laughs> you know, if you breathe out for longer than you breathe in. So let's say you breathe in for the count of three, you breathe out for the count of six, or you breathe in, you know, just regular breathing through your nose, you know, or out, you know, through your nose, breathe in for four, breathe out for eight. So that's just a, a way that you could get started. 
Um, another thing uh, that we could do, if you're open to it, if anyone is open, we could do kind of a breathing demonstration right now. Is any, everybody Let's open for that? So Let's do it. Let's do it. So um, this is, uh, I call this the mental reset breath. And uh, this is just a, it's a breathing technique that will help to balance your on and your off button. So um, we're going to breathe in through our nose. Uh, we're going to hold and then we're going to exhale through our nose. Okay, so let's say we're going to breathe into the count of five. We're going to hold, we're going to breathe out for the count of five. Um, and if you want to put your hands in this position, it just helps to balance uh, kind of the energy systems in your body and, and all the good energy that you're building up um, will stay. So I'm literally just going to count it out for you. Is that okay? So everyone kind of close your eyes if you feel comfortable and you're in kind of a safe place to do so. And I'm literally um, just going to uh, count it out. So again, you're breathing in through your nose, try to breathe in through your belly. So inhale, two, three, four, five, and hold, two, three, four, five, and exhale all the way out and inhale two three four five and hold two three four five and exhale all the way out and inhale two three four five and hold two three four five and exhale all the way out and inhale two three four five and hold two three four five and exhale all the way out and inhale two three four five and hold two three four five and exhale all the way out and for the last time breathe in through your belly and hold two three four five and exhale all the way out and you can start reorienting your attention kind of to our web gathering here um and if i could just uh, hear from any of you anybody want to share you know how you feel now Somebody want to share? Put it in the chat or we could feel amazing, fantastic. Uh, what else? Anyone feel more calm, clear? Um, okay, so uh, I don't know if um, you weren't able to track, but we did that for 90 seconds. 90 seconds. Can you see how much you can have a kind of a relax, they feel good? Um, how much of a change you can have in like literally. So I would recommend doing that for two or three minutes, but it's just a way of you kind of could feel that you're balancing your on uh, and your off button. It's a good way of getting into a clear state. So you do that when you are feeling stressed, anxious, maybe you just got some bad news. Maybe you have a, an email that you want to respond to or something that you know is, is it makes you angry or makes you emotional. Is that a good time to do something like this so that it kind of That's clears one of the good head? times to do it. I mean, I would, um, uh, and feeling calmer, it was so good. I love it. So, um, yeah, and you feel, you feel free and it's for free. <laughs> so it's really a business opportunity. Um, so, you know, I would uh, try to do this a couple of times a day, um, you know, after you've sort of had a period of working hard or if you need to clear your mind before you need to sort of think or you need to, or if you want to not respond uh, to a situation, if you want to rejuvenate yourself, like it, it's really good to just make it a general practice because what you're doing is you're entraining your body to be on and alert and, you know, facing situations, but then to be off, which will also help you to sleep well through the night. And if it's helpful, actually, I have a, um, I'm going to put into the chat or maybe you could circulate afterwards is that I have uh, an audio where I just count it out for the three minutes uh, for you and any of you can have access to that. And then like literally like you, you don't have to like just hear my voice, you know, popping it in, guiding you through and you can just let your mind uh, go free. So it's, um, it's a, uh, yeah, please put it in the audio and, or in the chat and then people can copy and paste the link. Sure. It's SharonMelnick.com forward slash mental reset. And it's in the chat and you know, Julie, maybe you can circulate it afterwards. Um, so Edie, Edie, you've got your calendar ready. 
Yes, I do. Okay, so um, let's take a look at that. There are some names of some people who I coached two years ago in there. Please ignore the names, okay? Because um, so you get the idea. Look at the colors. Okay. Oh wow! Amazing. Okay, so this is. Let me close this so you can see that. Okay. So um, this was a week, and it starts at seven a. This is seven a.m. to eleven p.m. Um, in my life. Okay. So um, on Sunday, I, I so orange is res things that are restorative or intention intend to be restorative. This is when I was working in Toronto, living in an Airbnb, trying to squeeze nine months of work into three months of work. Okay. So I agreed to perform in a festival. I came out of retirement to dance in a festival. So Sunday was, I, Sunday I had flown to Boston. We had a 6.45 rehearsal and we had an all day dance rehearsal performance festival and party. Um, and then um, blue is fixed appointments, work usually. Okay, so, um, so this was a course, these were courses I was teaching. These are, I was actually managing it all is the course on resilience and calendaring, so MIA. So these were courses that I had to teach. So those are courses where I, had, I have actual commitments and those, those, are, those are booked in. You see all the blue and you see names of people. Those were all the students that I, did, I was coaching. I intentionally put in blank space to catch up because if I'm gone, flying back in and have a class to teach, I can't book appointments because there is so much work that has to happen if this is literally blacked out, okay? And then I have something called blockity block block, which is the same thing when I block my acuity calendar. Basically, I make myself an appointment on my calendar so that I don't have to redo my appointment calendar, okay? I have food sometimes, whatever the categories are, okay? And then there are other ones which are generic. Now, Please note it says go to bed, go to bed, okay? Now it doesn't say go to bed every night because most nights I'm really good about going to bed at a reasonable time. But if I have to be at the pool to swim at 7 a.m., the minute I book a 7 a.m. swim in, I book a go to bed because we all need eight and a half hours of sleep opportunity minimum. So, so I, so when there are times when I have to get up at stupid o'clock, I mean, look, I have to be up at 6 a.m. I have to start teaching a seminar at seven, 7 in the morning on site. So I have a hard stop. I have a go to bed. And that doesn't mean start going to bed. That means bye-bye. Okay. So there are some intentional blank spaces, but there aren't a lot because our lives don't have blank spaces in them. So I'm going to stop the share for a minute. If somebody wants, I mean, I will, we so, can do a whole so the, session on. So you said, you know, you have to have more than two categories. You have to have more than a work category and a, a regular life category. Can you just explain that briefly? Yeah. So do you guys know the story with the big rocks and the little rocks and the sand? If you're trying to get all the things that you need to do in your life, you have, those are the big rocks, the things that are really important have to get done. And then the less important things are smaller rocks. And then the, Less of the nice to haves are sort of pebbles and then the rest of the stuff is just water. And what you, we, what you do is you, you, if, you, if you put the sand and the, the little pebbles in first, the rocks won't fit, right? If you mm -hmm. put all the unnecessary stuff in first, if you let the details and the nice to haves and the GI wish and the unregulated emotion driven stuff go in the container first, there's no room for the big rocks. But if you put the important things in the container first and you put the big rocks and then the small rocks and then the sand and then pour the water in, there's room for everything or almost everything, okay? Putting in the things that absolutely have to happen or you're not okay, all right? For me, if I don't work out, if I don't move, do something for an hour a day, I am not okay. I'm not okay. It's not nice to have, it'd be really good if I could walk every day. No, if I don't work out every day, I'm not okay. And if I skip two days in a row, I'm not functioning. And I'm admitting that and, and right, that's it. Now, instead of pretending that's not the case, how about we accept that we are human beings, we are living the human condition and you're of no use to anybody if you're broken, none. Because, and the, and the most efficient person to take care of you is you. 
No one can manage what you need any better than you can. Every people who are chasing behind you to try to clean up, they can't do it. So self care, making sure that you get the things that are restorative for you in the calendar first. And it's not okay, I wanna start training for a marathon. This is minimum, this is brushing your teeth, this is drinking water, this is sleeping, this is the minimum you need to function, take care of other people, stay healthy. Everything you need to do depends on this. Those go in the calendar first. Now, if you have fixed working hours, then be honest about what those fixed working hours, they are not nine to five, okay? Your fixed working hours are much less rigid than that because you have a lunch break and you have time to go to the bathroom and you have time to do, right? So put the real times in your calendar as fixed. Put your lunch break in as lunch and if lunch is, instead of lunch being lunch, can lunch be restoration? I spent, I've eaten thousands of meals, eat walking, okay? Because I, I don't need to sit and eat a meal. For other people, it's not restorative unless you're sitting in front of a plate, quietly focusing on what you eat, right? Is that one hour break that you have from work restoration break and do you use it? If you have a legal coffee break or it's okay to take a break, what are you gonna do on that coffee break? Maybe decide. If you're gonna get on Facebook, set a timer, boundary management. Don't get sucked into things. Okay, so that's, so I'm open to questions about the calendar. Does that make sense? So you put the big rocks in first, but really, and you also put the prep and cleanup time as part of the time. If yeah. it takes you, right? My workout is, my, my walk is 45 minutes, used, right? But I'm walking the dog instead of swimming. My 45 minute swim workout was on my calendar for an hour and a half because I have to get to the pool, swim, change my clothes, shower, right? Get in the car. So when you put things on the calendar, it's the real time, not the, I wish it took this long. Yeah. Not the punch clock. So it sounds like guarding your, the big point of that to me is guarding your self care time is absolutely critical. Um, and, and one of the most important things, let me, I, I, a question I, I find interesting from, uh, fr from the chat. Um, she says, having to worry about money and, the, and, and our business um, and, and during this crisis has been really stressful. Any tips on how to manage this stress? Sharon, you wanna go ahead? Go ahead, Edie, so it looks like you wanted to jump in, go ahead. No, actually I was just uh, putting my address in the, in the box. So you go ahead, cause you're the stress lady. <laughs> Um, I mean, so it's, I think it's coming back to some of the themes that we were talking about is uh, I think what's most important is that you really um, try to keep your head on uh, and um, uh, keep yourself in a state where you can think clearly and you can take constructive action, right? So, um, you, you know, uh, what, what I think is, is helpful is to, to um, try to stay close to what people actually need right now and what resources are available so that you could potentially pivot in your business, right? So I think that comes from uh, t talking to people and um, y you know having kind of a clear mind, asking good questions, constructively reaching out to people and, and asking, you know, what's going on for them or how you could be helpful and kind of, you know, having sensors out there as to what the possibilities are. I think taking constructive action to kind of learn about what are possible um, resources or grants or loans or partnerships or, you know, just any, any resources that could potentially um, be or, or, or new business uh, opportunities that could be uh, available to you. I think there the key is to not get frozen, uh, to not be in denial, right? Um, but to keep yourself in a state of motion um, where you can, um, uh, and, and doing so with a mindset 
that there is an opportunity here for you, right? And you may not know what it is yet, but um, again, when you have that, um, when you make that decision, you know, any, any belief that you have is sort of a decision that sets in motion um, what your brain kind of looks for, right, uh, in the world and in the environment. And um, so I think if you come in with that and if you have a, a sense of optimism, even if you, even in uh, the face of not, having, uh, bless you, even in the face of not having concrete evidence, that's what we call faith, right? So here's where we can turn to our spiritual, um, uh, con you know, connect or where we uh, derive that sense of faith from. But to um, have that sense of optimism, which creates uh, an optimistic picture that you will get through this, you will find a way, uh, even if you don't know what the specifics are, again, is going to inactivate a problem solving state in your mind um, and keep you in motion towards, you know, talking to people or finding solutions. I know that's what I've been doing for myself. I know too, also to, to address those issues head on, I think you said it, Sharon, not to be, uh, you know, don't, don't ignore the issues, don't ignore the problems. I know in our business, uh, when the financial crisis hit in 2008, we called every single one of our vendors and made a, an, an alternate plan, right, uh, for payment and for, for, for invoices. I mean, we got on the phone, we were very proactive. And in some instances, we got in the car, which we can't do today, but we went and saw them and showed them what our plan was for getting out of, out of this financial crisis. So I think being proactive when you have a financial issue or a money issue or a job issue, to be really proactive about it and address it head on, and it's gonna make you feel so much better after you've done that, and it's, instead of sort of burying your head in the sand about it. Another one of the questions, and, and I wanna- can, yeah, can I actually chime in on this one? Sure, absolutely, go ahead. Okay, um, and I can stay late, I don't know, I can stay a, few, a couple minutes late. Um, I'm going to go a different tack. We were so poor that when we went to McDonald's, my mother and I, my brother and I each got a small hamburger and my mother wrote postcards because wow. she couldn't afford three hamburgers. Okay. So when you talk about worrying about money, I get it. All right. Uh, so boundary management. If you need to worry about money, you put it on the calendar. I'm not kidding. I am going to solve, problem solve about money. This is it. This is my plan. You have an action plan. All right. And if you want to cry and you want to break down, you put it on your damn calendar. <laughs> okay. I'm not kidding. Okay. So if, if, if you have to action plan around money, put it in, schedule it, know that you're worried about it, know that you have to do it, and then you will have a time and place. And if you need to, whatever your boundaries are, Okay, if you need to go in the bathroom and turn on the radio and cry, fine, put it in your calendar, tell your community, that's it. I'm in a meeting. Okay, my favorite term is I have an appointment. Okay, you have an appointment. You have an appointment with you, you have an appointment with you. Okay, that's one. The second thing is ask for help, ask for help, ask for help. Okay, people have money. There are some people who can float you $100 for a week. And it won't bother them. And you can give them back $120 and a dozen cookies, okay? If you are not eating, if you are not buying medicine, like if this is for real, this is for real, declare emergency, it's okay. Right? You have the rest of your life to pay back, all right? We didn't have enough money for hamburgers and I just sold my mommy's, my mom died 10 years ago. I sold my mommy's condo for almost a million dollars, okay? Now that doesn't mean I got the million dollars, but the point is that, that for the last 20 years, we could 40, 30 years, we could afford hamburgers. You will get through this. And if you need hamburgers and you need a dollar, you ask somebody, okay? All right, so yes, use all the cognitive tricks. You, everything Sharon's saying is valuable, but I know that there are times when someone said that to me and I wanted to say, but I don't have money to pay the fricking food bill, okay? So there may be one person there who's feeling that, okay, this was for them. <laughs> so be in touch with me. If I, I'm happy to talk to anybody about anything they need. Okay, really, 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 really. So sorry if I jumped in on that one. But that no, one no, no, that's, va that's valuable. I mean, asking, that was the whole point is asking for help. It's okay. And, and I think 
um, people are more than willing to help you if you ask uh, a lot of the time. Um, one of the other questions that I wanted to, to get to, um, and, and, and the question is, some people seem to bounce back more easily and quickly than others. And we only have about three minutes left. Uh, is, is resilience something that you can, uh, I guess, work on and prepare for so that when a crisis hits, I mean, I, I, I don't know how to answer how some people handle it better than others, but is, does that question make, is that question make sense? I could do a real quick one. The emotional resilience is there's 50, 50 nature nurture with a lot of this stuff. Okay. Some people are just that way. They're born like that. They wake up, they're happy. They're sunny. Everything is good. Some people, you, they can make it rain on a cloud on a sunny day. Okay. So, don't so judge that's yourself. how you are. Okay. So half don't. of it is, yeah. The other part is about learning skills. And that's what we've been talking about here. So this, the, you know, figuring out the behaviors and conditions that restore and deplete you and managing them. That's, that's what we talk about in my book, Personal Resource Management. It's called, the book is only available in hard copy. I, I, I just found a box in my storage unit. So if you need a copy, that's fine. We can get on the call, some, whatever you need, let me know. Okay, but I'm going to be quiet now. But figure out what conditions and behaviors restore and deplete you, manage it. But don't blame yourself because you're not resilient. Take care of yourselves, <laughs> get there, and then you'll be all right. I hope, fingers crossed. Well, if, if we want to, one of the questions... Edie, and I want to I want to ask you. I just we were running out of time. Was are there some ways that you can have a restoration vacation uh, at home? And I, if you, I want to go to Sharon real quick. But if people want to stay on the call a few minutes longer to answer that question, I'm happy to do it. And and if you need to go, I understand. But uh, I'm happy to stay on a little bit longer so we can get to this because it is. I think it's a, a great question, Sharon. Um, what do you think about uh, people comparing themselves to others in terms of how resilient they are and how uh, it, it, I'd, I'd say don't do that, but it, maybe that's easier said than done. Yeah. Um, well, you know, one of the things that I've been seeing in myself and in everybody else is that um, we're all bringing with us everything that um, we, you know, was sort of resolved or unresolved in our lives before this moment hit. Right. And um, and then this moment is just sort of exacerbating all of that. And um, so uh, I, I'm seeing this as an opportunity. But but now it's sort of like, well, we really have to deal with these things. You know what I mean? Um, that are in ourselves, whether it's that we're doubting ourselves or whether that we've been living month to month, you know, in terms of our uh, expenses. Uh, or whatever it is, and um, like you know, as as the saying goes, like this shit is real now. You know what I mean? Like if I, if I can just sort of like be real here, and I think that um, and it's like requiring us now to to really um, face these things, and and that's why um, you know I know um, for myself in terms of um, comparing yourself, you know that that's. Um, that's of course going to take all of us down a rabbit hole. And I think like what I've been trying to do is, you know, if there's people who are um, examples of how to, um, you know, be resilient or who have mindsets that I could see like they're taking constructive action, then I'm trying to learn from them, you know, and I'm trying to think like, okay, um, you know, how, you know, what, what about this situation might be happening for me instead of to me? And anytime I ask that question, it sort of um, brings me back to like, okay, you, you know, and um, so I really want to hear from Edie about how we can have like a restoration vacation, you know, while we are in place. But the, you know, what I associated to that is um, that the, the most peaceful experience that you could ever have is creating an experience of that within yourself even in the midst of, you know, we've all seen, you know, sort of pictures of meditators in the midst of like a New York City, you know, traffic jam or whatever, like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? There's, there's nothing um, more than that. So if you can um, try to understand the things that come in that kind of take you off of your center 
and by not comparing and using this as an opportunity and um, accessing that internal pharmacy that we have, that's a way of um, creating that oasis in the midst of chaos. Yeah, I, we were on this, we, we, the MG100 have a call pretty much every morning and, and one of the things that came up this morning, which I thought was interesting, was they said that during this, they've taken themselves off of social media, right? And I thought that was probably pretty wise because we often compare ourselves to other people on social media. And I thought, you know, that's probably reduced their stress level considerably uh, because, uh, because this is hard. And, and, and they were talking about how hard this is um, and cooped up in a small apartment in, in New York City. And, uh, you know, that makes sense to me that uh, you just you sort of get th rid of some of the things that cause you the stress and that you, you really have to think about uh, those things and, and then try to get rid of them so that you, 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 um, it, your level of stress is not, not as high as it, it, it is. Edie, what, what can we do? to have a, a, I love the idea of creating that within yourself, Sharon, but are there some other things that we can do Edie, at home to create a restoration vacation? So a restoration vacation by definition helps you restore all everything back up to your maximum. And I, I can't create that for you. I'm not that good. However, um, I'll give you the general stuff and then maybe we'll set up a call and we'll actually do a restoration of workshop, which walks through the whole process of how to do this for yourself on a daily basis. But in short, are there behaviors and conditions that are restorative for you? Create those. So for example, what is part, if, if part of your normal restorative set is, so I'll do mine. I go swimming, I go to the pool. I go to the swimming pool, I get in the car, I drive to the swimming pool. I say, I, I say hello to the person at the gate. I go in, I walk, I go to the right, I go to the locker room. It's usually, sometimes I go for a water exercise class. Let's use that one. I say hello to all the little old ladies in the class because almost everybody's a little old lady in the class. And I hear them discussing things. And I say, and I live in Israel most of the time now. So there's the little Arab cleaning lady who almost nobody talks to except the little old ladies who all talk to the Arab cleaning lady. So I watch them interacting with the nice Arab cleaning lady. And then um, we go do the water exercise class, which is phenomenal. And the pool is, 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 has bright sunlight and, and the water temperature is good. And I w work out and then I go back, reverse that thing, and then I go home. Okay. What's restorative about that? So now I can't go swimming. Okay. So people say, okay, I can't swimming. I'm in trouble. No. So what are the components, the restorative features of that? Why does doing that restore me? Let's go. Let's go in order. Physical. Physical motion, okay, full body motion, water going over my body, head movement, not a lot of sound, big open visual field, sunlight. What are the cognitive, what's the cognitive load? What's my intellectual load? I don't have to solve any complicated problems. I'm following, I'm not leading, right? The teacher is leading the exercise class, I'm following. What's the level of conversation? Not hard, I don't have to be creative. What's my relationship to the people? No accountability. If I say something stupid, it doesn't matter, right? People are friendly, people are nice. Okay, so it's nice social light discourse, connection with human beings, right? What are, the, what are the conditions around it? What's my emotion, what's my narrative around this? My narrative is I'm doing something good for myself. I need this. Being part of the community helps the community because I'm younger and I'm fitter. And so if I'll do this, if you're 90 and you do this, you don't have a bad narrative about yourself, right? What is the psychological, what's the emotional um, contagion in the room? Everybody's positive, everybody's happy. So everybody's picking that up, okay? Now I've deconstructed that. Now, how do I reconstruct it here? I'm staying with my friends with a puppy in California, no swimming pool. Okay, I need sunlight. So I'm going for a walk. And when I go for a walk, I'm doing stupid shit like this. I look like a crazy person because I have the dog strapped to my, my pack and I'm backstroking, right? While I move, right? I take a double long shower and I've started using something that gives me more tactile stimulation. So I have a rough scrubby because I don't have all that water going over my body for 45 minutes. So I'm replacing the tactile. I'm replacing the vestibular stimulation. I'm getting out in the sun. I am deconstructing what worked for me and reconstructing it. And yes, it takes two, three, or four times longer to get it, right? Because it's not efficient. 
So what is it that was restoring you? Do you miss your commute? Why? You miss your commute because it's quiet? Good. Schedule in a commute. You miss your commute because you're moving? If you're allowed to drive your car, get in your car, right? You're trying to be replace the behaviors and conditions that restore you, okay? And especially the narrative that you have around it, okay? If you sit quietly and read junk novels for 10 minutes, it can restore you unless your narrative is, I'm wasting my time. So change your narrative. What do you tell, what's the story you're telling yourself? And it should have something to do with my being well, whole and resilient. This is necessary during these times. And it, in the end, it's gonna help everybody. Does, does this help? So you're trying to create those conditions and build them in. And if you have trouble, email me and say, this is what I'm trying to replace and I'll help you figure it out. I'm okay with this, right? One day we'll all be rich and powerful. For now, we just have to stay sane. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Go ahead, Sharon. I've got to, I've got to um, jump off, but I just want to say what a privilege it was um, to be on here uh, with you, to learn from you, you Edie. Thank you so much, uh, Rhett, for uh, creating this community. Thank you to uh, Julie for curating this. And uh, thank you all for your good work. You've all been chosen uh, to do the work that you're doing because you're providing so much value for so many people. So really, you know, connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, and uh, so, some of you were asking about Success Under Stress uh, book. So yeah, that's, that's available wherever you can purchase books. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, I, Sharon. Actually, I'll put the name of my book in. Um, so you guys are all State Department in Brazil, right? So these, these you, you missed the intro. Yeah, ahead, these are alumni of exchange programs, uh, State okay. Department. Okay, because I have I have a state to, I have a friend who State Department used to be State Department in Brazil, but never mind. We'll play you, social tag another time. <laughs> okay. Um, Everybody here is uh, alumni of a U.S. exchange program. They're young entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs, and right, so. Better. Uh, uh, but anyway, you guys, thank you. Uh, we've gone a little bit long. I do want to thank uh, Sharon and and Edie uh, and uh, for for being on the program uh, for being here today, and. Uh, you know, take care of yourself, uh, make that a priority. I think that you can't take care of others unless you take care of yourself. And uh, we look forward to being back next week. Uh, I saw some comments here about continuing this through May. If, if that's something that would be useful for you guys, um, we are happy to do it, but please be in contact with Fernando and Julie about that and, and see how we structure that. But we're happy to do that. And uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity. I'll turn it back over to Julie. Just on behalf of the U.S. Embassy and Consulates here in Brazil, thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you, MG100, our partners. Thank you for volunteering your time to share your expertise. I realize I need to fix my calendar and schedule things. I need to breathe uh, and ask for help. Yes. So I yeah, I hope everybody is taking away things that they can use even today. Um, we also put a link into the chat, and that's to a survey to see what topics you'd like to do for the next two panel discussions. So please let us know. Um, we will. This is recorded, so we will share a link with you guys as well. So if you want to go back and look at it um, to review, Julie, so can I have a can I have a copy of that too? I'll send it sure. to you. I'll send it to you. Sure. Um, and if, any, if, if you are okay with showing us your screen and giving everybody a wave, I think that would be nice <laughs> as a we way all, of connecting. We all have sloppy Thank houses. You. you can make your background Hawaii if you want. <laughs> That's why I have a flag back here to hide the mess. You could do virtual Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. See you next week, same time. Bye, Julie. Nice meeting you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye, guys.